I think this thing will take some time to come on. Very soon. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's see if this is working. So today we will be talking about uh, computational psycholinguistics. So this is definitely a departure from all of the stuff that we've been talking about to this point. Um, here we're mostly concerned with using computational models to try and understand how humans are actually understanding and producing language. Um, so based on all the stuff that you guys sent on the topics that you want to cover, a lot of you ask to cover more classical NLP algorithms such as parsing and so on. Um, I think this will be a good segue into Wednesday's lecture on parsing so people can understand, um, you know, maybe parsing is not as useful for modern NLP tasks such as the ones that we've covered in this, uh, this class so far. Um, although, you know, 10 years ago it was extraordinarily useful, but there are still other, um, other aspects of syntactic structure and explicitly getting syntactic structure from sentences that have impact in, in other areas, and, and this is one of them. So before we start, um, so no more quizzes for the rest of the semester. You only have your project report left to do. It's due December 16th. There is a overleaf template um, that's now available, so you can start filling that in with um, all the stuff that you've done so far. Hopefully that's a non-zero amount. Um, regarding your exams, we are still grading them. Um, hopefully sometime soon you will have the grades. Um, and yeah, so regarding the project report, uh, it has some specific things that you need to do um, section by section. Make sure you adhere to all of the different like length limit, uh, like it should be at least eight pages. Uh, no filler material. Every semester I say this and like half the groups get points taken off because they obviously just didn't have enough to say or they didn't do enough or whatever. So make sure that um, you've done enough work such that you can fill in at least eight pages and fill out all the sections do a good job with your error analysis and of course you can write more than eight pages if you wish and um, you know many many groups have done that in the past but this is like the bare minimum that you need um, to, to write without losing points. All right any questions on non uh, topic related stuff? Okay. So uh, the topic for the day is computational psycholinguistics. So uh, whenever we have these questions about human language processing, right, how do humans understand or produce or even learn language, um, you can set up experiments that uh, kind of model various aspects of human language understanding with a model and uh, probe the behavior of these models and see how they match up with how humans behave in certain experimental conditions. So we'll be looking at all three of these um, aspects, comprehension, production, and acquisition today at a very high level. So uh, you should understand that you know, this is a whole field in its own right. I'm just giving you a, an overview today. And, if you're interested in learning more, there are papers that are referenced throughout this lecture that you can check out um, and, and learn more. Okay, so uh, you might be wondering how computers can even help with this considering we barely, uh, we, we know so little about how the human brain even works and especially how it operates when confronted with language inputs, right? What exactly 
is it storing in memory? What kind of representations is it creating from uh, you know, both small and long, long inputs? Um, how do we produce how do we produce seamlessly outputs given a certain context? Uh, how do we switch between different contexts robustly? All of this is, is kind of unknown. And um, the way in which we will tackle the, these questions today is to encode um, some major assumptions that we or hy hypotheses that we have into a very simple computational model. Uh, which we can then easily analyze, which is obviously not the brain, but um, perhaps we can correlate the behavior of our models to um, some actual human behavior. So let's look at an example. Um, one phenomena that we might care about is disfluency. So every time someone goes uh, and forgets what they're saying, right? That, that's an example of a disfluency. So I read a book about uh, uh, psycholinguistics, right? That was just an example of this fluency. So, um, what could cause a person to produce this fluency? Does anyone have any ideas? Sure. So maybe they're not familiar with the particular word that they want to produce, or maybe it's a difficult word, or they haven't heard it or said it in some time, so they're having trouble recalling it. Anything else that might affect? Sure, so maybe they're talking in a language where they're not too familiar with the overall syntax or vocabulary or so on, so it's difficult for them to um, maintain a certain speed of production. Sure, so maybe they have a bunch of competing things that they want to produce and they don't know which one will most effectively communicate the meaning to whoever they're speaking to, so they're pausing to evaluate. Is it a completely lost sure, maybe they've completely lost their train of thought and they need to just reconsider everything before uh, producing this, this word. Right, so this kind of related to some of the other points, right? Maybe they're considering uh, really carefully what to say. Maybe they, they have multiple competing hypotheses and they don't know which one will be received best. Sure, yeah, they could have some disease or other condition that's affecting either their ability to recall this information or produce this information. Um, you know, another reason is they could just, well, I mean, kind of, uh, um, oh, there's a disfluency, right? <laughs> like wrapping together a bunch of these reasons is maybe they're distracted due to either some condition that they have or some external condition. Maybe there's a lot of noise or something like that preventing them from or distracting them from their, their train of thought. So you, you came up with a ton of reasons. Um, Let's just boil this down into two reasons, which might be uh, the most important ones. So first, they have issues with the word that they're about to produce. Uh, so maybe it's difficult, at least in this context, or it could be very rare, or it could be long, it could be hard to say, you know, all of these things. Or they're distracted due to some something uh, in the middle of the sentence, and that's uh, causing the disfluency. So everything else we'll ignore, right? There's so many possible causes of a disfluency. Um, we can't possibly model them all, but maybe we'll stick with these two and see uh, if they have an effect in producing disfluencies. So you can set up like a very simple model. Now that we have only these two possible hypotheses for things that could affect the probability of producing a disfluency, you could set up this simple network here where you can see that hard word or distracted, these are the two conditions, and we have the probability of producing a disfluency here, uh, and setting our graph up in this way allows us to cut some of the dependencies between the nodes, so um, we can model this uh, probability as follows. Probability of a hard word, probability of a distracted condition, 
and the conditional probability of a disfluency given um, the settings of these two other conditions. So now that we have this set up, we can design a human experiment to see if uh, you know, both of these things actually affect the production of a disfluency. And if so, which one uh, maybe contributes more? Or do the two conditions kind of stack up and have a higher probability of producing a disfluency? So you can set up a human experiment. Uh, we won't go into exactly how you set this up. You can imagine um, you know, setting up something as a distraction, maybe amount of noise, or maybe something pops up on your computer screen when you're about to uh, produce some certain word or something like that. Uh, and you can also imagine controlling the hardness of the word, right? So you can set up different sentences and ask them to read them or produce them, um, where the word in question is either very high frequency and familiar to almost everyone, or it's very rare and they might not have ever seen it before, and so this might cause a disfluency. Um, so this is one example, and, and so you can get humans and put them into these very controlled conditions, right? So maybe they're sitting in front of a, a computer and they're asked to respond to certain things or even read aloud certain sentences with, with these two conditions, and you can measure, okay, did they say uh before um, you know, producing the word that I want you to produce? If so, there, you'll mark them down as producing a disfluency in the setting. If not, uh, you won't. And eventually, after enough trials, you can um, you know, start to compute some statistics, right? So here you can see that in the hard, if you're given a hard word in a distracting sit situation, uh, there's a 60% chance that you might uh, produce a disfluency. So this is one example of how to set up a human experiment to measure uh, these hypotheses that you have. So if we take a step back and think about all the possible uh, properties of interest in human language processing, um, and if we want to kind of replace some of our, since you know, putting electrodes on someone's brain and measuring various signals, and this is actually done, but the, the types of signals that you get are uh, kind of very coarse grained, so it's hard to correlate them to low level properties that, like we might want um, in, when we have research questions like what is causing a disfluency. Um, so if we have a computational model of sentence processing that we're using kind of instead of or along with uh, human experiments, um, we would want a model that's kind of robust to arbitrary inputs, right? So this model shouldn't only be able to process a certain type of sentence or a small vocabulary, right? It should be able to uh, you know, produce representations that demonstrate some understanding of any arbitrary input string. Um, and if there are cases where there are multiple possible interpretations of what the meaning of the sentence is, we'll look at a lot more of these later on, um, it should be able to choose the most likely interpretation of all of these multiple interpretations. Uh, I mean, human language uh, is very ambiguous in, in many cases, and the context in which certain things are said make it obvious what the most likely interpretation is. So any computational model needs to have this capability of scoring different um, hypotheses of what the meaning of a sentence is. Um, and it should also be able to infer things based on partial input. So you could be, you know, given part of a sentence, uh, predict the most likely continuation. Or if there's noise or something, be able to fill in things that are expected to um, be in this, this uh, input. Yeah. So the question is, how do you have a computational model understand um, the most likely interpretation of a given sentence? So you can set up, uh, so let's say you have a language model, for instance. You wouldn't say this understands a sentence in the way that a human does, but you could also use it to score various interpretations of a sentence. So like given some sentence, you could also say, you know, uh, you, you could even give it a, a follow-up a question, for example, like, 
what is the subject of the sentence or, or something like that and measure the probabilities that are output and use that as a proxy for understanding. Um, of course, it's not perfect. No one is saying a language model is doing the same level of understanding that uh, a human is doing, but um, these are ways you can, you can go. And we'll see later on there are other ways that you can test um, you know, which interpretation of a sentence a model is actually preferring. This is where kind of parsing comes into play as well. So we saw one type of experiment with the disfluency thing, uh, which is mostly a behavioral type experiment, right? So given some certain situation in which a human is asked to produce language, what choices do they make in different conditions? Um, you can also measure how long they take to measure uh, different conditions, uh, to, to make different choices. So uh, measuring things like reading time, for instance, is a popular way of figuring out if something is difficult or easy for a human to, to process. Uh, there are other studies that do things like eye tracking. So if you ask someone to read a sentence or a paragraph, you can look at what words they keep coming back to in the, their eyes, right? keep scanning back to in the paragraph or sentence. And maybe these are more important words. Maybe they're more sources of confusion. Uh, who knows? But you can, uh, okay, you can study uh, all of these uh, various uh, uh, data that you get from, from these experiments. So there's also offline experiments where you have complete sentences or paragraphs or whatever, and you just ask humans to give you ratings of those sentences. So a common thing to rate in these kinds of experiments is acceptability. So do you think that this sentence is grammatical or acceptable given your language, or your knowledge of language, or not? Uh, I mean, we've seen variants of this, uh, of course, not associated with uh, psycholinguistics, but for evaluating like text generation models, right? Give me, given a sentence, rate it from one to five on how fluent it is or how coherent it is. Um, more interesting ones are online experiments where you actually get humans in a room and you're measuring certain signals. Uh, I mentioned eye tracking. You can also have people read aloud and measure various time or um, disfluency type things. Um, have them read under time pressure is, a, is a, an, another thing you can do. So do they make more mistakes in certain situations where they have limited time to read? If so, where are those mistakes coming from? Um, and you can also measure things like brain activity with uh, various things like EEG. Um, but of course, these are expensive uh, experiments to run. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, so here we have a, an example of ambiguity. So you can set up uh, behavioral experiments as online experiments. They're not like distinct categories. It's just a little misleading, but um, yeah. OK, so uh, the women discussed the dogs on the beach, and the women kept the dogs on the beach. So in each of these cases, you can ask the question, what does this prepositional phrase on the beach modify? So in the first case, the women discussed the dogs on the beach. Uh, how many of you think the dogs in the sentence are on the beach? Raise your hand. How many of you think the women are on the beach? Okay, interesting. Uh, what about in the second uh, sentence? The women kept the dogs on the beach. How many of you think the dogs uh, are on the beach now? And how many of you think the women are on the beach? Okay. So uh, interestingly, <laughs> it's kind of uh, departed from the consensus, at least in 1982. Maybe language has changed since then. <laughs> well, oh, the women discuss the dogs, comma, on the beach. Um, yeah, so there it would be clear that, uh, what would be clear there? The women were on the beach. <laughs> the women are on the beach, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like dogs is reasonable in this case, too. I probably would have chose dogs. Uh, but, but it is ambigu ambiguous, right? Um, it could be either. 
But anyway, in these kinds of ambiguous cases, it's common to collect a lot of human judgments for each case, and you can find out which uh, condition is kind of preferred by the average human if you collect, for example, like 100 judgments like this. Um, so we'll talk more about parsing next time, but in essence, a parser will take in a sentence and give you a tree-like structure of that sentence. And you can think of it as, uh, for simplicity, a binary tree. Uh, so there's some root node, and you have all these different um, uh, branches, and eventually the leaf, uh, the leaves of the tree are associated with the words in the sentence. So this is a parse from 1982. I mean, parsing was really bad then. It's much better now, but um, uh, still not, not perfect. And it's unclear what to do in these ambiguous situations, right? So a parser is, is usually something that keeps in, in uh, it gives you multiple hypotheses and scores them of what the correct parse is. And you can imagine in this setup, uh, the location of on the beach and what it's connected to in the tree can vary, right? So in the top case, on the beach is um, modifying, it's part of this verb phrase and modifying keep here, so it's not modifying the dogs. But here, in this bottom side, you see that the dogs on the beach are part of this noun phrase. So this means that on the beach is attached to dogs um, and not keep. So uh, here you see that keep the dogs on the beach, where on the beach is like where the location of where the dogs are being kept is by far the most probable um, interpretation here. So you have a probability of 0.12 versus 0.01 for the, the other case. Um, however, when you look at discuss the dogs on the beach, uh, here the probabilities are much closer as to where this on the beach is actually attaching. Um, and so regardless of the actual numbers here, you can see that compared to the human results, where 90% of the humans in, in the study were uh, preferring on the beach, uh, the, the um, interpretation that it modifies dogs. Um, here you can see that the parser thinks it's much closer, right? And the degree of which the parser prefers one interpretation over the other is not matched by the human preference. So, uh, you can see one way of potentially studying whether the human brain is keeping into account, uh, is keeping you know, both of these interpretations and scoring them and so on. How similar is this to what a parser is actually doing? And in this case, the parser is kind of deviating from human behavior because it has both of these interpretations uh, at a very similar probability versus what you see with a human. Yeah. Oh, right, right, sorry. So, yeah, I was debating if I should do this lecture first before parsing or after, but um, I decided to do this one first because it's more fun. But yes, a VP is a verb phrase, an NP is a noun phrase. A V here just refers to a, a word that is a verb. Um, and so you can see that uh, these there's a grammar that is allowing the tree to be formed, like a verb phrase. That here's an actual rule that uh, shows you how you can construct a verb phrase. What are the individual elements that make up this verb phrase? So here you have to have a verb. And in this particular rule, if you have a verb followed by a noun phrase, and I don't know what an XP is, it's probably any sort of uh, other phrase, you can uh, form a verb phrase. So a grammar usually consists of a bunch of rules like this, where you have a left-hand side, which is a the type of uh, phrase being formed, and you have the, uh, wait, sorry, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which is all of the uh, constituents that make up that, uh, that phrase. So um, if you have a bunch of these rules, then you can start to parse the sentence by following these rules, and sometimes you might find that you have many possible uh, parses that are all valid, that they all follow the grammar, and they lead to the uh, a full parse of the sentence, but 
some of them are more probable than others based on the uh, probabilities associated with each of these rules. Um, so we'll talk a lot more about this on Wednesday. But um, yeah, these are basic linguist, uh, linguistic constituents or to phrase types, like noun phrase, verb phrase, so on. Um, it's a little more advanced than part of speech. Part of speech is only at the word level. Here we're dealing with uh, you know, multi-word expressions. So there's you know, even an S, it refers to a sentence. Uh, so that's what you would see at the top. Do you have a question? Yeah, so the question is, shouldn't you ask instead of rate which one you prefer, uh, one or uh, like this binary ranking, uh, can't you ask them on a scale, like which uh, maybe, maybe they would say they don't know, right? Uh, I think the idea is that if you get enough of these judgments, you can actually see that uncertainty emerge in the aggregate, um, but you have to get a lot of the judgments. The downside to having some sort of uh, you know, like slider or something to allow them to rate the magnitude of their preferences, the calibration issue, right? Uh, and it's very hard to calibrate something like this. Uh, it's also hard to even explain, you know, like what do you mean by, uh, so that's why the, the simplest question is usually the best to ask. Okay, so, uh, so far we looked at, you know, there was ambiguity in these cases, but the sentence was kind of easy to follow in general. Um, a lot of the work in psycholinguistics focuses on a specific type of construction called a garden path sentence. These are usually harder even for humans to read, but they provide uh, a lot of interesting data for understanding what our brains are doing. So in this example here, we saw there are two possible parses, at least in this example, for where on the beach is going. Either it's modifying discuss or it's modifying the dogs. Um, either it's like the location of the discussion or the location of where the dogs currently are. Um, and there are two parses of the sentence associated with each of these interpretations. So one interesting question is, how many parses does the human brain keep in its memory if it is in fact doing something like this uh, while reading a sentence? And so there are several hypotheses you could have. One is we keep only one parse at all times in, in our memory, right? So we discard all other possible interpretations. So this is kind of like analogous to greedy search or greedy decoding like we talked about, right? We're throwing away all other potential things we could generate in favor of just producing this local uh, argmax at every time step. Another one is keep all possible parses in our head while we're reading a sentence. So what are some potential issues with, with this? Right, so imagine you're reading a fairly long sentence. There could be a huge amount of parses that correspond to all interpretations of this. Um, and you know, similar to enumerating all possible outputs from a language model and picking the most probable one, right? This is probably not possible with uh, even our human brain. Although, who knows, right? Again, <laughs> who knows, a common uh, question. But it seems reasonable that there's some middle ground between these two options that is more like what we're actually doing, right? So maybe as we're reading, we score possible parses and we discard ones that we think are not probable, and um, we keep the ones that we think are most probable, and we adjust this as we go along. Um, so this is kind of similar to beam search, right, in this, this kind of analogy that we're making. So let's read this sentence. The comp, the <laughs> okay, well, I guess the pronunciation kind of gives it away, right? So if I were reading this left to right, it's likely that as soon as I read the complex or complex, right, I'm going to think that it's the adjective, right, the complex houses. And then if I read the complex houses, I would immediately think, what, is, what does that mean? Maybe it refers to the architecture, right? Uh, but here I'm treating complex as an adjective and houses as a plural noun, which is, I assume, what most of you did the first time you read this sentence. But 
in actuality, if you read the rest of this, uh, so even if you get to the fourth word, right, the complex houses married, now this is, this is kind of strange, right? Uh, you, and so possibly at this point, you would go back to the beginning and say, okay, well, the parse that I had, probably not the right one. Let me just read this again and see if I can make sense of it. This is something you can actually look at with eye tracking studies to see if, okay, if they got to some point, did they just return to the beginning and read it again? Maybe this is a sign that they're, they didn't have a valid parse at that position of the sentence, so they had to go all the way back. So here, the actual correct interpretation is that this com complex, complex is a noun, right? Like an apartment building. Houses is a verb. And married is a, not a verb, but uh, a modifier of students, right? So this all becomes clear once you read the rest of the sentence. But um, of course, just reading this left to right as the words appear, you can imagine this is a very uh, popular setup in these kinds of experiments where you read the words left to right, they only appear, at, like one word appears every second or something. So you can see how quickly you can get misled into the wrong interpretation. Um, so, you know, if you, if you have this model of like, uh, what did we call it, limited parallel, so we're preserving some of the parses but not all of them, it is possible that the, uh, the correct interpretation where the complex is the noun phrase here gets discarded by your memory, right? And the one that co the complex houses is the noun phrase where complex is an adjective, this one is preserved. So this is probably what happened to most of you. Um, and you can also measure the probabilities of both of these interpretations that a parser assigns to each of these kinds of um, uh, these interpretations. So here, the complex houses, you can see complex as an adjective, houses as a noun, and this one is preferred by multiple orders of magnitude over this one where the complex is a noun phrase and houses is a verb phrase. Yeah. So the garden path refers to the fact that the uh, interpret correct interpretation of the sentence only becomes apparent after you read the full sentence. And if you stop like midway through, like you don't have all the information you need to properly predict the correct interpretation from um, like in, in just the, the first part of the sentence. So it's kind of like a winding path uh, and you need to be uh, aware of all of the information in the sentence to make the decision. It's easy to get misled. Uh, and these garden path sentences are kind of specifically constructed to be misleading so that you can measure these sort of huge differences between human uh, interpretations. They're also designed to have multiple interpretations it be possible at least for some, some number of words in the sentence before uh, the full sentence is revealed. Okay, so, um, right. We also see from the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but in, in essence, each of these rules here, like a noun phrase is formed from a determiner, adjective, and noun, is associated with some probability. Like the rule has a probability. You can estimate that from a corpus, like a tree bank, where linguists have annotated the occurrence of all of these rules and the correct uh, tree as uh, in accordance with whatever linguistic principles that, that they have. Uh, and the schema that they're using to annotate. So you can basically count up and normalize and find the probability of each of these rules in isolation. And as we'll talk about on Wednesday, um, we can then use dynamic pro programming algorithms to given the probability of all these rules uh, and given a sentence, how do we combine them together and find the probability of like a whole uh, bigger phrase or even a sentence like this and how do we use these probabilities to prune things, to maintain um, kind of like this limited parallel setting as well. But uh, yeah, basically you have a probabilistic grammar where every rule in the grammar is associated with a, a, a probability. So the key for probability 
Yeah, so the question is, if you change the, the corpus uh, which you're using to estimate these uh, rule probabilities, do your probabilities of, of like the ones displayed here change? Yeah, uh, I mean, you would probably change the, uh, the estimates of their individual rule probabilities. Um, but you would hope that they're kind of robust. Um, obviously, if you choose a, a very noisy tree bank or something, it, it could have uh, huge effects. But in general, these tree banks are uh, very carefully curated. They're annotated by linguists, and they're, they're uh, checked and double-checked to make sure that there is a high agreement. OK, so let's move on to um, surprisal. So here, if we have the sentence, the squirrel stored some nuts in the tree, this is a totally normal sentence. Uh, if we said fridge, then this is something that's probably unexpected, right? And we can see in things like human reading time that the first condition here, people spend less time overall reading this, this sentence. And also, if you attach like electrodes to a person's head and make them read this sentence, uh, or, or both versions of the sentence, you can see a huge difference in uh, activity. So there are many different ways to measure that activity, but yeah, and there are certain types of signals that um, people have found are pretty correlated with uh, uh, reading um, and, and reading surprising words. So one of those is. The uh, N400 is a specific type of signal. Uh, so we might be interested in quantifying surprisal. Uh, so if we have a language model, for instance, how do we say that the squirrel stored some nuts in the tree is less surprising than the squirrel stored some nuts in the fridge? Uh, and one obvious way is we, why don't we just take a language model and look at probability of tree given this prefix versus probability of fridge given this prefix, right? And in essence, that's what we do to calculate this quantity of surprisal. This is like an information theory concept. Um, it's just a function of this uh, log probability of the, the next word. Um, and so if, uh, so the surprisal for fridge here would be higher than the surprisal for tree. That's basically what we want. It indicates that fridge is unexpected in this context. Um, and so there have been some very interesting studies that, and this is again, is kind of linking the computational models to human experiments that show that this surprisal quantity correlates linearly with human reading time, like is measured in seconds or milliseconds or whatever, uh, like per word reading time. Um, in uh, language models. So uh, if you get humans and you ask them to you know, read this uh, sentence, and so basically these reading time studies work like they are asked to click a button to get the next word of the sentence, and you can measure how long do they take to click the button to get the next word. So if they get a complicated word, um, like fridge, for instance, Maybe they will pause and try and reanalyze the sentence to make it make sense before they get another word. So you can measure that time. And the idea is that if they're taking more time, um, this is correlated linearly to the surprisal of the word um, that is assigned by a language model. So an n-gram model, it was shown like a trigram model. The surprisal you get here, you can just learn some simple coefficients to uh, transform this into an estimate of the reading time, and you can get pretty high correlation. People have also shown this more recently with uh, neural language models, like recurrent uh, language models, and so on. Um, however, that doesn't mean that these language models are behaving the exact same as humans. Actually, in these kinds of confusing garden path sentences, the correlation seems to break down. So language model surprisal does not linearly correlate to uh, human reading time when you have these complicated constructions. And this is pretty interesting because it seems like the language models really are not bothered by these garden path sentences at all. They uh, kind of assign similar probability to a, a word within an ambiguous or confusing context and with, uh, without that uh, context. Whereas a human 
obviously has a hard time kind of making sense of, of the word in a garden path context. Um, so this, this work came out you know, just last year, so it's obviously an active area of research. Um, and possibly this kind of thing could also inform the development of uh, language models, right? Maybe it it's worthwhile to explore models that behave similarly to humans on these particular constructions. Um, so lots of interesting stuff going on here. Okay, so we can switch to uh, production of words, um, if no one has questions. All right, let's, let's do it. So, uh, so far we've been talking about kind of comprehension, right, which in humans we can study through these kinds of word, uh, time to read a word, or eye tracking, or EEG, or whatever. There's also production, right? Um, so in production, we're, we're looking at how humans decide what words to actually produce given some context. Um, and there's a cost to producing different uh, competing candidates given the same context. So that has to be modeled as well, right? So you're going to produce some utterance conditioned on uh, the meaning of what you want to produce as well as the input context in which you're producing this. Right, so it could be whatever you've said in the previous, the previous X words that you've said. Could also include what the person you're talking to has said before that. Could include this whole history of the conversation. It could include the surrounding environment and context uh, and whatever. Um, but you might have multiple different candidates for say the word that you want to produce next. And each of those is associated with some cost the cost on you to produce this word, the cost on your uh, conversational partner to understand your meaning, right, and, and so on. So if you look at the factors that determine the cost of an utterance, uh, let's think about what we are actually doing when we, when we speak, right? We're trying to convey some meaning that we intend, um, and we also don't want to waste time, right? So I could probably stay on the slide for the entire rest of the lecture and just drone on, but that would be a total waste and painful for everyone. Um, we kind of want to be as short as we can while also conveying the full extent of our meaning. And finally, we want to minimize the effort that it takes to comprehend the utterance by whoever you're speaking to, as well as on you to produce the utterance. So, if you're constantly using like huge rare words, maybe you're taking a lot of time to retrieve those. It takes a mental effort. Also, if you're using like you know garden path constructions or lots of embedded clauses, that also takes time to even understand how to what order to say your words to make it grammatical and so on. So maybe you stick to simple short sentences and frequent words. Um, to uh, minimize the effort on your production, or maybe it's easy for you to produce those things, in which case that's not true. But um, anyway, let's, let's take a look at this example. So let's say I intend to say, I'd like a beer. There are many different ways in which I could say this, or, or convey my meaning, or at least try to convey my meaning, right? So of course I could say, I'd like a beer. I could say, where can I get a beer? So this is a different way of conveying the intent, maybe also asking for additional information. I could say nothing and just do something like this, and many people would understand what I'm trying to say. I could say some sort of like branded slogan, like it's a Miller time, and people who are familiar with the this, this slogan would, would understand the overall intent. Uh, if <laughs> could say I'm in Germany, I, I don't know that this is a particularly effective way of communicating uh, this intent. Um, or I could just uh, growl, I guess, and so maybe some people would understand uh, what I'm referring to. But here you can see that like there's a there's a ton of surrounding context that is um, also helpful, like body language, pointing to things linking, uh, you know, like world knowledge, like the slogan of a beer company, and so on. So if we have a bunch of these plausible utterances, how do we decide uh, which one to produce? So it's similar to the question that we looked at in comprehension, right? If we have multiple possible interpretations 
of a same sentence, how do we choose which one that we think is the intended meaning? Here, the problem is we want to produce a bunch, we want to produce some meaning and we have a bunch of different ways of conveying that. Um, so you can say, if we look at this example, uh, Terry gave the exhausted traveler from France a silver dollar. The meaning here is pretty clear, but I can say the same thing and add an extra word. Terry gave a silver dollar to the exhausted traveler from France, right? So here, it's completely explicit that this dollar is being given to the traveler, although everyone would understand the same meaning from the first sentence, right? Here, the least we should do is make it as much fun as possible. The least we should do is to make it as much fun as possible. Again, here, both, both interpretations, we understand the, uh, con the intended meaning, but how do I decide whether or not to include this to, uh, right? Maybe in some cases, it's very helpful to include the two. Um, it makes the listener more likely to understand what the meaning is. In other cases, it's unnecessary. It's already obvious, and so I can drop it with no consequence. So this is a common kind of experimental setup in these kinds of production um, experiments where you can boil down to a, a very, very specific phenomena and examine in what cases people prefer one over the other. Um, so in this experiment, we can look at the dative alternation. So if I'm looking at this verb gave, there are uh, kind of two ways in which I can express the same meaning. So in this prepositional dative case, I could say, I gave toys to the children. Um, in the competing approach, the double object structure, I could say, I gave the children toys, right? So here, there's no two, but I think we can all understand the intended meaning in the second case, right? The children are the ones receiving the toys, even though there's no two. And in some cases, we might want to use one over the other, so we might be curious in what exactly those cases are. Uh, and we could have different theories over why someone would prefer one over the other, right? So the first case, this prepositional dative gave toys to the children. This signals, uh, in this hypothesis at least, the transfer of location. So I had the uh, toys, they were in my possession, sorry, they were, they were in this location and now they were transferred to this other location with the children. Uh, whereas this double object, perhaps we can say that this signals transfer of possession. So these toys were mine, and now they're the kids. Um, so there's a slightly different, perhaps, semantics of these two, even though we just said they probably mean approximately the same thing. Maybe there's some subtle difference in meaning that it's hard to even verbalize, but exists and, and causes people to prefer one over the other. So I sent storage a book. Right here, storage is kind of this animate thing, right? This maybe organization or group or something where they're getting this book uh, versus I sent a book to storage. So here now the probably uh, inferred, um, like the common inference is that storage is some location and the book went from my location to the, the location of the storage. Uh, you can compare this to that movie gave me the creeps so this is the double object construction. The um, creeps, uh, I guess here, I don't know how to interpret this with transfer of possession. The movie had the creeps and now I have the creeps. That seems wrong. Anyway, that movie gave the creeps to me. That is kind of an unnatural way of saying this, this uh, sentence. Okay. So uh, one popular way of studying these things is kind of to get rid of the, any connotations that are associated with the actual wor words in, in English or whatever language is being spoken. Instead, you can form some fake language with fake words and ask the similar sorts of questions. So the rom gorp the blicks, blick to the dax. And you can ask people, how likely is gorping to involve moving something? Right, so how many of you think that gorping involves moving something, just given this? How many of you don't think that? 
okay, so, so it's pretty close. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's no right answer, right, because these are fake made up words. <laughs> but uh, it's still informative to look at the aggregate judgments that you get from humans when you ask them questions like this. So what about now? The ROM, GORP, the DAX, the Blick. Does GORPing involve moving something here? How many of you think so? Just one, two. Okay, how, how many of you don't think so? All right, the vast majority of you. Um, interesting, I don't know what to say about this. I'm, I'm not a psycholinguist. <laughs> um, okay, so th this is one theory, right? The actual, even though we think that these things are very similar to each other, there's some subtle difference in the meaning of associated with both of these constructions, uh, having the two versus not having the two. Uh, another theory is that there are preferences for one construction over the other depending on the context. And this is kind of independent of the meaning of the, this utterance. Did you have a question? Uh, all the ones in this, uh, this lecture are English specific, but people do these same studies in other languages as well. Uh, clearly also in big languages. Okay, so in this theory, you could say that, okay, these, these two things have no semantic difference, and it's purely a function of the context that someone decides to use one versus the other. Um, so some potential uh, types of context in which the processing preferences could change are discourse given versus discourse new. So this is the first time the toys have been brought up in the conversation. Or have we been talking about the toys for a while now? And maybe if we've been talking about the toys for, the while, for a while, it's very clear like all the properties of the toys and I can use the shorter construction versus um, if the toys are new or if the kids are new, maybe I want to be very explicit about um, you know, the, the fact that the kids are receiving the toys. Uh, short versus long, so maybe uh, the word that you're producing, um, you know, kids is very short, but if you said some very long, rare word, maybe you would prefer the shorter construction instead of the longer one. Uh, you know, there's many, many different things that you could, you could kind of analyze about the context that could have an impact on which construction you choose to use. And the general conclusion behind all of these kinds of experiments is that there is not one right answer. All of these things influence the way in which people decide which construction to use. Um, so, for example, the length of the recipient, um, so the, the kids here, or uh, all of these kinds of things, discourse status, uh, whether it's new or old, seem to have some correlation, uh, or if you train like a regression model, they have some sort of importance to predicting whether or not someone will use this construction versus this one. So it's kind of hard to tell between these two theories. Um, so if we have these two theories, uh, it's generally not the case that we're trying to pick which one is right, but we're just trying to figure out maybe which one is more important in a particular situation, like maybe um, sometimes the meaning intent overrides the, uh, the type of context in which this is being used. And so again, you can set up this highly simplified graph and try and solve, uh, you know, measure, set up your human experiment and see what actually is going on. So one interesting experiment, uh, again, with these fake words is, uh, I mean, we can actually measure this kind of thing in a human experiment, and as I mentioned before, people like to use these fake words to remove, as a, a kind of control. So if we have this sentence, the Zarg masked the Charid to a really grimiest flig that was all charpy, uh, you can read this and actually try and fill in this mask word with um, English verbs, right? So if I asked you to do this, what is the most, uh, so what verb comes to mind here in English that you think might make sense with the rest of the sentence? Uh, obviously, given that you don't know what any of these words mean, but still, like, maybe the structure of the sentence gives you some clue as to the meaning of this, uh, this uh, verb. So anyone have any ideas on 
a word that could go into this mask token? Did he say gorp? <laughs> An English word. Okay, so the Zarek took the chariot to a really grimiest twig. Yeah, that, that, that seems to make sense. Any others? Follow? The Zarg followed the chair. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so these are two kind of location type ones. Any others? Sure, the Zarg gave the chair to a. So here, Flig is not a place, right, but a, another type of animate thing. Any other ideas? Com the Zarg compared the chair. Oh, wow, that's uh, nice. Uh, definitely possible. So the people who ran the study actually did this. They asked people to fill in the, the English uh, word in the mask token. And they had a couple of things like brought, carried, delivered, funnel, prepaid. That is <laughs> it's interesting. The Zarg prepaid the ch Is that even? I, I don't know why you would say that. Uh, fed, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, right, but. Um, it's interesting that a lot of these verbs are associated with transferring location, right? Or transferring possession, like brought or uh, delivered, bequeathed, right? Um, you don't know what any of these words mean, but there are commonalities between the words that you, you all suggested and the words that, this, that they found in the study. So clearly the construction here is providing some clues on, on at least the kind of word that can go into here. How do they know that these are just random words? I don't actually know the details of the study here. I guess you could check out these papers, but I assume they, they just figured that uh, whoever was doing this task was acting in good faith. They were probably you know, like undergrads who were getting paid or something. So I don't know if you can uh, always assume that, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, at some level, it's hard to, uh, you know, control for, or just assume that everyone's doing the task uh, in good faith and probably some percentage will never be doing the task in good faith. Okay. Um, so, if you have something like the Zarg prolted the chariot to a really gromious flig, you can also ask people which is more likely. Um, the chariot is in a new place, or the chariot has a new owner. And this is a way of even like untrained uh, people who are doing this task can choose one of these, and then you can kind of match it up with either the theory of like location, one of these is associated with uh, different meaning, right, Lo moving location, and the other is associated with uh, change of possession. Um, and if there's no agreement on this question, right, then perhaps uh, there is no change in the semantics between these two constructions, and the uh, choice of one of these versus another is purely uh, a result of the context. Yeah. So I guess the question is, instead of making up these words, why not just use blanks maybe with suffixes or something to, I don't really know. Um, maybe it's easier for people to just read uh, even if, but I agree, like it would be interesting to take this same sentence and then have like a bunch of versions of it with completely random made up words in each and see if the results change at all, right? Maybe if you change Zarg to Darg or something, your whole experiment is invalidated. <laughs> that, that would be interesting to see. Um, at, at some level, it's hard to do this because it's, you just have to keep replicating your experiment. Uh, so it's obviously much more expensive. Um, I don't know, there, there's probably some studies of this that I'm not aware of. Uh, that would be cool to, to check out. Yeah. Is there a last 
Possibly, yeah. I, I mean, Perlted versus some other random string of letters with ED at the end. It would be like maybe you could do a very controlled study of different like uh, consonants or vowels, and maybe yeah, some of those are more it, like I don't know implicitly associated with certain semantics than others. Um, yeah, this is like the end of my knowledge, so I have to, I don't really know either way how to explain this. Um, so in this this paper, they basically looked at all of uh, these two theories, right? And uh, the summary of their results was that both the meaning changed, so like location versus possessive, and also the context. Um, so like these these things here, whether it's new or old, both of these things matter uh, essentially. So you don't get a nice story that oh well all this this uh, choice of whether to use this construction with the the preposition or this one without it, uh, this is not always down to semantics. It's not always down to the context. It's a combination of both. So you don't get a nice result here, but you probably will never get a result like this with, uh, with human um, language processing. All, we're considering so many different things at once. Uh, probably also several um, conditions that were not even tested in this experiment also contribute to which uh, version of this we choose to produce in, in a given context. Okay, so, um, right. One other thing about production is the fact that even in cases of huge amounts of noise, we are often able to uh, communicate our exact intent to other people, right? So even if you know half my words are being masked out by some like giant fan or something, you would probably still un vaguely understand the gist of what I'm trying to talk about, um, you know. And in the case of other distractions and so on, um, so. Uh, W the f despite all of this noise, we're still able to communicate pretty well. How is this possible? And uh, a follow-up question is, if it's the case that we are able to communicate in conditions of heavy noise, it's likely that there's a lot of redundancy in our uh, production patterns, right? So if the giant fan masked out one word in what I was trying to say, um, it's unlikely that you're not going to be able to understand anything at all, right? I probably said the same thing many different ways uh, and you were able to understand it then. So how do we achieve this kind of redundancy? And so one theory that is uh, pretty popular is this theory of uniform information density. So if you have some information that you want to convey, uh, this theory suggests that you are going to try and spread it out evenly, all of the important information over the, uh, the course of the utterance rather than pack it into like one segment of the utterance and have all of the other parts of what you're saying be irrelevant or unnecessary. Um, so you can see these kinds of plots here. So they're pr plotting a surprisal, again, just a function of the probability uh, of a, a language model. And you can see that, and you can even measure this, uh, the human preference for a sentence that has high peaks and valleys of surprisal. So you might say a bunch of uh, unsurprising stuff and then follow it up with something very surprising, then again go to something not surprising. So have this like very jagged pattern where there's a lot of surprising and a lot of very unsurprising things. Versus this kind of flat pattern where everything is almost equally surprising. Um, this is kind of preferred for both production and comprehension um, than this. And there have been many studies showing, so if you treat this as uh, the information density can just be measured as a function of surprisal, you can use a language model to make plots like this for sentences that just naturally occur in uh, text corpora, and you can you can uh, use that to measure whether your theory is valid. So there's been a lot of support for this this kind of theory that uh, uh, people don't like or or don't uh, often choose to produce a lot of high surprisal words. Instead, they pre prefer to um, even out everything across the the utterance. 
So one example um, experiment that you can look at is the word that. Um, you know, this is something you might have wondered about. Like, in what cases do I need to explicitly have the word that versus not? Uh, so how big is the family that you cook, cook for? It's also equally valid to say how big is the family you cook for? Uh, maybe not equally. I guess one of those is probably more acceptable than the other, but um, they, they're, the intended meaning is the same, right? The you cook for is modifying uh, the family here. So what is the purpose of the word that? Um, here, it's essentially to first show that a rel relative clause is beginning. And without that, you may not know this. It may, might take you some extra time to figure out, OK, this is a relative clause. It's modifying this word family. Um, and second, it might provide some information about what is to come in that relative clause. So the question is, under what conditions should we use the word that versus not use the word that? Um, OK, so I guess I don't have an answer to this, but I assume people have set up experiments similar to the one like uh, this one to measure um, you know, which conditions do people use that versus don't. And I also assume that the results are mixed. Right? There's probably a bunch of factors. It's hard to tease out which ones are actually important uh, regarding the context and the semantics. OK, so the final thing I wanted to talk about before uh, the end of the class is acquisition of language. So there are basically two extreme viewpoints here in how do we learn language like as a kid, right? So one is we're born with it. We're born with this ability to just rapidly pick up language from uh, very few input data points. Uh, the fact that we're able to do so means we have some sort of built-in mechanism in our brain, probably the result of evolution that allows us to um, learn some sort of grammar and so on. Another viewpoint is we have none of that. Instead, we learn everything we know about language from scratch, from the input that we get by hearing you know, our parents talk or people talk or by interacting with the environment and receiving uh, language-based feedback and so on. That is sufficient for us to pick up um, language. We have a very powerful algorithm in our brain. It's clearly, not, um, uh, it, clearly far more sample efficient than uh, like a large language model, for example. So these are the two theories. Um, and then one question, if you subscribe to the latter theory, is how does something come out that does not go in? So essentially, how are humans able to behave the same on inputs that they have no way of observing through their training data, right? the input that they receive? And this question is basically the uh, object of most of the studies uh, around language acquisition. You can set up cases where you have a situation that's very unlikely to be observed in, say, a kid's uh, input, like day-to-day -day input, and then you see how they behave in this situation, like which preferences do they have for um, uh, a particular interpretation of the situation. And if they're all behaving the same, that kind of indicates that they have some similar mechanism in their brain that is allowing them to process language the same way. Perhaps. I don't know. Um, probably the most famous example of the first case is Chomsky's universal grammar. So many of you might have heard of this. The theory that all humans are born with this genetic capacity to acquire language. Um, there is some sort of language acquisition device in that terminology in our brains. We don't know exactly how this thing looks. It could even, some people think it could even be, you know, like an actual grammar with rules or whatever. Um, probably probably not actually like that, but. Um, and once this device, however it works, receives some language-based input, the child will start the linguistic stages of development. And, um, you know, some evidence for this, that all children will develop language re regardless of the kind of input they receive. And the language that they develop has very similar properties. So some of the arguments for this universal grammar uh, hypothesis is that 
all of the world's languages are obviously different in vocabulary and, and syntax and so on, but they also share many common properties. Uh, and it's interesting, right, because these languages might have developed um, some in isolation from others, but they still have common properties. And despite each child observing completely different inputs growing up, they all rapidly converge to approximately the same um, grammar. So how is this, how is this possible? Another uh, uh, argument that is made in favor of this theory is, the, is called the poverty of the stimulus. So here, it's the, basically the case that uh, any child, uh, regardless of what input they're receiving, does not receive enough data to generalize to all possible situations. And some situations are just not observed in normal conversations. So um, in these two sentences, I like this ball and you like that one or I like this red ball and you like that one. In the first case, the one here is referring to a ball, right? In the second case, one is referring specifically to a red ball, or I guess it could be referring to a ball, but that's a kind of a dispreferred interpretation compared to red ball. And so people can do these experiments with kids to see which interpretation they prefer. Uh, here they found that 18 month olds show a preference for the red ball interpretation of one here. Um, and similarly, there's also this example. While he was dancing, the Ninja Turtle ate pizza, or he ate pizza while the Ninja Turtle was dancing. So in the first case, this he, this pronoun, could refer to the Ninja Turtle. In the second case, the he and the Ninja Turtle are clearly different, right? So this interpretation is not valid. Um, so they had this puppet show, I guess, with Ninja Turtles eating pizza or someone else eating pizza. I'm not exactly sure how they measure with preschoolers which interpretation they prefer. Maybe they ask them some questions or something. Um, but the preschoolers also learned this interpretation um, despite the fact that these kinds of, um, like the, the other condition here, so he and Ninja Turtle referring to the same thing uh, is not observed in, in language, right? So uh, they all somehow converge to the same interpretation. Uh, so <laughs> at the end of the day, there are lots of questions around this universal grammar theory. Like, what does this language acquisition device look like? Is it just a dictionary in grammar uh, encoded in some like neurons, uh, however that works? Um, or do we have some learning algorithm, like some general purpose algorithm, and there's some inductive bias on it that allows us to all converge to some solution? Or does this even exist at all? No one really knows. Um, and uh, I mean, it's a, still an open question that's hotly debated after all of these years. You know, you have some linguistics departments that are Chomskyan and fully are all in on this theory, and others that are not as convinced. Um, so who knows what we'll find out in the future, but uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's all I had to say. So next time we will talk about uh, parsing, so actually figuring out how we, we get those uh, syntactic structures like the NP and DP and their layout, the tree layout from sentences. Um, so see you then.